wonderful to be back here. I had the chance to talk with so many of you uh, two years ago uh, about the Second Amendment. Uh, I appreciated the introduction. I, I've had worse. Um, pre President Clinton once introduced me. He said, this is Michael. He put his arm around me. He said, he's the guy who types my speeches. So, <laughs> so that was accurate, but not, I hope, complete. Um, I like that one better, and I'm appreciative to all of you for being here. Uh, this venue, as you may know, is known throughout the country as one of the best places to talk about ideas, to meet a community of people interested in ideas, and uh, we, all of us who pass through, appreciate your welcoming us. Um, it's also exciting to be here in a time uh, of turmoil and tumult in the middle of the most topsy-turvy uh, election that any of us can remember, uh, a time when we know that future historians and future generations will try to unpack and puzzle through what we the people have been saying uh, in this election. Um, and I'm asked when I uh, talk about the book, um, having worked on these issues, as it was described, the Brennan Center for Justice, which I lead, is a nonpartisan law and policy institute affiliated with NYU Law School. We fight to uh, and seek to help with the revitalization and reform of the systems of democracy and justice in America. We take our name and our legacy from the late Supreme Court Justice William Brennan. 20 years ago, we were started by his family and clerks when he left the court as a living memorial. And we do work on these issues every day. We think that in fundamental ways, the system of American democracy, we've long felt, has, has been uh, on the wrong track uh, or in, in basic ways has needed repair. And I'm asked, given the work we do, given the fights we fight, why did I write this book now, this book which uh, looks in so many ways at the history of the country on these issues? And the answer in part is because I believe that our democracy is facing strains and stresses and pressures that it has not faced in a long, long time. Uh, this year, 16 states will have new laws in effect that make it harder to vote for the first time in a high turnout presidential election. It's the first presidential election in half a century without the Voting Rights Act in full effect because it was gutted by a five to four vote of the Supreme Court in 2013. It's the first election where we are facing the full, somewhat ambiguous but unmistakable impact of Citizens United, uh, the Supreme Court ruling that allowed into our system a flood of new money from a tiny handful of donors. There's obviously been a lot of money in American politics for a long, long time, but this is the fact. Uh, in the last election, the top 100 donors gave more than the 4.75 million small donors combined. That's a level of concentrated political wealth that we've not had in this country since the Gilded Age. Adding to this the general uh, decrepitude of the system by which our machine, voting machines work and by which we run elections, the ongoing problem of gerrymandering and rigged election lines, it's not a surprise that in the last election, voter turnout plunged to the lowest level in seven decades. Um, this is a challenging time. Even before anybody cast a vote in this election, there were yellow and red lights flashing. And what I wanted to understand uh, and wanted my readers to understand is, is this new? Is there something new about what's happening? And the answer, perhaps not surprisingly, is this. Today's controversies, the fact that the Right to vote now seems to require the fight to vote, as the title suggests. The fact that these core and basic issues of American democracy and governance are once again at issue. These issues are controversial, and they are consequential. They are fights that are intense, but they are not new. 
the fight to vote has been at the center of American history and American democracy from the beginning. It's been in the middle of election campaigns uh, from the beginning. It's often been raw and rowdy and frequently partisan the way it's played out. And just as people have had to fight at every step of the way to gain their voice, uh, to get their seat at the table in American democracy, others have fought just as hard to stop them and to restrict that right to vote and to restrict the meaning of that right to vote. And it's also interesting, as I learned in uh, digging into the history of American democracy, that um, it's never been just about the formal rules of who can vote. It's been about the many other ways in which that vote can be diluted in its impact. It's been about the interplay between wealth and democracy. Um, and uh, it, it is a fight, as I say, that didn't start last year or 50 years ago in Selma, Alabama, but 204 has been going on for 240 years since the founding of the country. So in a way, as crazy and uh, sometimes in encouraging and inspiring and sometimes dismaying and distressing, in a, as different as this moment sometimes seems, it's actually in the great stream of what might be one of the great American stories, this fight for meaningful democracy. And as I say, it started going back all the way uh, at the beginning. The book starts in 1776 when Thomas Jefferson, in writing the Declaration of Independence, said that the government was legitimate, uh, as he put it in the preamble, only when it rests on the consent of the governed. And this was a revolutionary idea then and now. And of course, it wasn't the, the reality then. I, of course, note that he was, at the moment he wrote that, being attended to by a 14-year-old slave boy, Bob Hemings, Sally Hemings' brother. But it was an idea that had such power that it took on a life of its own. At the time of the American Revolution, at the time of the country's founding, only white men who owned property were allowed to vote. So obviously a very small part of the population. And uh, this was a rule that had been passed down, a tradition almost, from England. And that's a widely known fact. What's not as widely known is that this was controversial even then. In 1776, and one of the great pleasures of the book, of learning the stories in the book for me, is learning there are a lot of heroes and a lot of villains, and a lot of them are people we don't know, but a lot of them are roles that are unexpected, perhaps, for some people we do know. Benjamin Franklin led a working man's revolt in Pennsylvania in 1776 to demand that the right to vote be expanded to all men, regardless of property ownership. And he, he said, um, you know, a man owns a jackass, so he can vote. Then the jackass dies. The man is wiser, he knows more about government, but he no longer can vote. So Franklin asked, who therefore has the right of suffrage, the man or his jackass? <laughs> that was a pretty compelling argument. And, he, and Pennsylvania adopted wide voting rights and um, was the most radical constitution in the world ever devised up until that time. Others uh, put forward a, a, a much more restrictive view, which is in a sense another theme throughout American history, a counter theme. John Adams up in Massachusetts was writing their constitution. He was urged to expand the right to vote. And he was aghast and he said, women will demand the right to vote. Lads of 18 will think their interests insufficiently attended to and they will demand the right to vote. Men who hath not a farthing to their name, he said, will think themselves worthy of an equal voice in government and they will demand the right to vote. There will be no end of it. There will be no end of it. And of course, Adams was exactly right. That's basically the summary of the book. There was no end of it. This idea of uh, democracy took on a life and became the animating force throughout much of the country's early history. And uh, the first great breakthrough for voting rights um, came in the 1820s and the 1830s when they ended the property requirement. They allowed all men, all white men eventually, who, uh, to vote even if they didn't own property. And of course it's an interesting thing because in the current political context as we think about 
uh, Donald Trump and his supporters, the very first voting rights victory in the United States was won by angry white men, white working class voters who demanded that they be able to vote. And one of the stories of the American democracy, which was a bit of a surprise to me and may come as a surprise to you, is that this fight is not only one that's been waged by activists or by citizens demanding their rights, but very often by savvy party insiders and by political parties as the engine of expanding democracy. And that was the case then. Uh, one of the key leaders for voting rights was Martin Van Buren who was the organizer of the world's first mass political party, what we now know of as the Democrats. And Van Buren was no <coughs> firebrand. He was no, uh, he was no ideologue. He, um, in, uh, in New York State, he was in the New York State government in Albany. One state senator bet another one. He said, I bet that I can get Van Buren to give a straight answer to a question. And he went up to Van Buren and said, Mr. Van Buren, is it true that the sun rises in the east in the morning? And Van Buren thought, and he said, well, seeing as how I never arise that early, I cannot speak from personal experience as to whether that's true. <laughs> so when we seek authenticity, think about that. Um, but Van Buren was the one who won the right to vote for millions of new people. And democracy uh, took hold in a fundamental way in the United States with mass participation and mass political parties. This created its own momentum. And the next great breakthrough came during and after the Civil War. Because, because of course, the, the uh, bitterest exception to that American ideal came uh, in the original sin of slavery. And after the Civil War, Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, uh, declared that the new fight would be to extend the right to vote to the former slaves, to African American men. And Abraham Lincoln had actually been against voting rights for black people, quite vocally. Um, he was no supporter. But the war changed Lincoln on this as on so many other things. By the end of the Civil War, one out of every 10 Union soldiers was a black man. When Lincoln gave his great second inaugural, half the audience at the Capitol were African American men and women, many in uniform. This service in the military won them, in a sense, their place at the table in Lincoln's eyes. And two days after the surrender at Appomattox, Lincoln gave his first major speech on what he wanted to do with Reconstruction, what he wanted to have happen after the war. It was a long speech. Uh, from a second floor window in the White House, he said, by the way, I've been criticized for the fact that my reconstruction plans and my first efforts did not enfranchise the former slaves. I now agree with this criticism. I think the vote should be extended. Uh, and he said to those who served in the military, to the educated, and actually the cabinet meeting, he indicated that he was gonna go much further, go all the way. At least one listener caught the significance of what Lincoln said. John Wilkes Booth was there. And when Lincoln said this, he gasped, he said, that means citizenship. That is the last speech he will ever give. He tried to get the guy standing next to him to shoot Lincoln on the spot. It's actually true. And when that guy wouldn't do it, he vowed, well, then by God, I will put him through. And two days later, went to Fort Theater. This issue was so at the heart of what it, what it meant to be an American. There was such power in that notion of the right to vote that it motivated John Wilkes Booth to act. And as you may know, uh, the, in fact, the former slaves, the men, were enfranchised after the Civil War. The 15th Amendment to the Constitution, uh, for the first time, declared there to be a right to vote in the Constitution. And one of the interesting things I should say is this right to vote was not in the original Constitution. It's been added in five separate constitutional amendments, not by judges and the, not by the courts, but by the people in making these amendments, as well as in other ways, fighting for it on the streets. And that was the first time. And the right to vote, it had also been in the 14th Amendment, but explicitly in the 15th Amendment, a lot of people don't realize there was, as a consequence of this, a flowering of democracy in the American South under the watchful bayonets of the US Army. 
Voter participation rates among black men reached 90%. There were hundreds of them who ran for and won office as state legislatures and in Congress and as governors and senators. Uh, but this brief period, often forgotten, was crushed. Uh, the promise was revoked first by terrorism, by the Ku Klux Klan, which was effectively a, a paramilitary arm of the Democratic Party at that point, and by cowardice from the North when they withdrew the troops in a political deal in 1876. And as you know, that, that right to vote for African Americans was crushed in the South, was effectively revoked. And this uh, monochromatic single party, Democratic Party South, known as the Solid South, especially anchored into place by these Jim Crow constitutions a few decades later. That Solid South was the central fact in American governance for well into the 20th century, into my lifetime. Uh, and it, it, uh, it's something we all know about. What people don't know about quite as much is something similar happened in the North, not as bad, but something similar. The northern cities were now flooded and filled with immigrants. Not from Mexico, like you hear about on the campaign trail today, but from Ireland and Italy and Poland and Eastern Europe. And the elites of their day, the kind of blue bloods in the north, suddenly had second thoughts about voting and democracy. John Adams' great grandson said that if you have universal voting rights, uh, you will, we will have a dictatorship of the proletariat, the African proletariat, uh, he said the Celtic proletariat in the north, the African proletariat in the south, and the Asian proletariat in the Pacific coast. So they actually put in place a whole bunch of rules and laws to make it harder for these new immigrants, for working people, for uh, non-English speakers to vote. And voter turnout was dampened very considerably. Adding to this in both the North and South was the new role for the first time of a new factor, big campaign money f uh, from the robber barons in, uh, of the very unequal uh, Gilded Age. And so in the late 19th century, in the late 1800s, American democracy actually moved backward. And that is one of the disturbing lessons of history is that history doesn't only move forward. In the late 1800s, emphatically, American democracy constricted. It moved backward. Um, what happened then? What happened then was a great reaction. Uh, we know it in the first instance as the progressive era. And you know of the progressive era maybe as the time when government began to get stronger and do regulatory things like pure food and drug laws and antitrust laws. But if you look closer, it's, it's really amazing to see how central this issue of the state of American democracy was to the Americans of that time. There's a great deal of similarity to today. People were angry. They felt that government was rigged, that the political system was corrupt, that it was not working for them, that it was inadequate to the challenges of the time, that they were being buffeted by demographic and uh, economic changes. And their answer was to revitalize American democracy. From top to bottom, there was a, a, an incredibly vibrant movement that went on for years where people took the matters in their own hands and improved and changed the way the government worked. Um, the first uh, campaign finance laws were passed during that period, the first federal campaign finance laws. And there was another constitutional amendment that was added to the Constitution, the 17th Amendment, which gave citizens the right to vote for a United States senator. Up until that point, senators were elected by the state legislatures. And this was seen as a form of, of campaign finance reform because the legislatures were deemed to be corrupt, to be owned by the big special interests. And so giving people the vote was a way to, the vote could conquer the role of big money. But the biggest change that was wrought during this progressive era is one that we know about, but we kind of skip over it in the textbooks, which is the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, the amendment by which women won the right to vote. Now, you, you know, we all know that happened. You might see it in a museum and see a picture of someone with a, you know, a woman with a sash and a funny hat. Um, it sort of said, when then women got the right to vote and they pass on to the more dramatic fights later. What I learned 
and what the history shows is that fight for the vote for women was every bit as hard fought, as fiercely opposed, as contentious, and as creative as any voting rights fight before or since. Uh, you might know that in 1848, Seneca Falls Declaration was the first time that the, the demand for women to get the right to vote was, was really put out there. But not a whole lot happened after that for decades. And it was not until 1911 that a handful of young women, uh, many of them had been in graduate school in England where they participated in the very rambunctious suffrage movement there. Uh, and they came back and they said, well, we're going to try something really audacious. We're going to pass a constitutional amendment uh, to get the right to vote. And just three months later, Woodrow Wilson, newly elected president of the United States, got off the train in Washington, D.C. the day before his inauguration. And nobody was there to greet him. The, that's not, the Princeton Glee Club was there to greet him. That's actually, that was it. They sang some songs. The New York Times wrote, making up an enthusiasm for what was missing in numbers, they greeted him. They were Democratic boosters even then. But that was it. And Wilson's aide kind of looked around and said, uh, where are all the people? And the hosts sort of sheepishly had to admit, they were all down at Pennsylvania Avenue, where there was a giant march for women's suffrage for the 19th Amendment. 5,000 women were marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. They were led by, uh, by a young woman on a white horse dressed as a Greek goddess carrying a banner. She was a recent graduate of NYU Law School, which is, gives us all great, great joy, uh, named Inez Mulholland. Uh, 5,000 women, many of them in rather preposterous costumes. They were dressed as what they thought the people looked like in countries that had the right to vote. Anyway, it was an incredible march. And surrounding those 5,000 women as they marched on either side of Pennsylvania Avenue were 100,000 men, men mo many of them drunk. They were there for the inauguration. And the men started throwing things and cursing, and they broke through the lines and assaulted the women, beat up the women, sent 100 of them to the hospital. The women had to fight their way down Pennsylvania Avenue to the end. This was a big deal. <laughs> this was widely publicized. The publicity for it in some ways overshadowed Wilson's inauguration. Uh, the police chief of Washington, D.C. had to resign because of it. And public opinion, seeing the violent assault on nonviolent protesters for the right to vote, swung in support of women's voting rights. And on learning this story, I, I, my reaction was, Gee, that, that sounds just like Selma 50 years later. And in fact, it was just like Selma. It was the, the spectacle of nonviolent protest being met by uh, violence. And it was the beginning of this incredible campaign of newly developed tactics of protest and civil disobedience. They picketed the White House for two years straight during World War I hunger strikes, they formed a political party, they ran candidates, all this stuff uh, well before Gandhi was using these tactics in India, before the American labor movement was using them, and certainly, of course, before the civil rights movement used them. And it worked. And in 1920, uh, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was created, was ratified, and the size of the American electorate basically doubled at, at that moment. It was an incredible victory, one we don't think about that much. Um, and uh, again, it was this interplay between the people on the streets and the politicians in the suites of power that did it. And political parties, the Republican Party was actually the party that fought for women's voting rights at that point. The 20th century, of course, was a time when there was continued and eventually very strong pressure to expand democracy in America and to make that right to vote meaningful. And of course, the, the greatest breakthrough, the ultimate breakthrough, was in, in the 1960s with uh, the Voting Rights Act. And I won't belabor the story because you're all familiar with it, of how the marchers in Selma, Alabama, uh, inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King, marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge were assaulted by the law enforcement forces of the state of Alabama. It was televised widely. Um, 
and, uh, and, and react, created a, a massive, almost spontaneous national mass movement of revulsion and demand for voting rights. Um, and the one thing I guess I would say that was of a significant interest is just how intricate the interplay was between King and Lyndon Johnson. Again, the, the voice of moral witness on the outside and the savvy political insider. Um, much, more, uh, much more interesting, frankly, than the way it's portrayed in the movie Selma. I don't know if you saw the movie Selma where Johnson is kind of caricatured as this retrograde figure who isn't supporting any of this stuff until, until it's too late. Uh, when King and Johnson met, um, John, King would push Johnson for voting rights, and Johnson would say, I'm for it, but it, we need to pass the Great Society first, basically. And uh, King, and then Johnson would get kind of worked up about how great voting rights would be, and King barely could get a word in edgewise sometimes, so all these t conversations are taped. King, Johnson never told King. They met three days before Selma. Johnson never told King, by the way, I've ordered the Justice Department to draft the Voting Rights Act, and we've negotiated it with the Republicans. It's ready to go. And King never told Johnson, by the way, two days from now, we're marching in Selma. These brilliant, canny, viscerally talented Southern politicians were engaged in a, uh, a, a, a game of power at an incredibly high level. And uh, as you know, uh, Johnson felt the pressure and used the pressure that was on him. Uh, went, uh, decided to go before Congress to call for a Voting Rights Act, um, and went before the Congress and uh, proclaimed, we shall overcome, in, in this great speech where he uh, embraced the slogan of the Civil Rights Movement. And that was really the great breakthrough, one not in a courtroom, but on the streets and in, and in Congress. And it was not only the Voting Rights Act, it was at the same time a, a constitutional amendment ended the poll tax, thus enfranchising black and white and all Americans regardless of wealth. Uh, with a few years later, in the middle of the anti-Vietnam War protests, the voting age was lowered to 18, as John Adams feared it would be. Um, and the American politics achieved a level of equality and formal openness that it never had had. And that mo many of us grew up thinking was the way it was, the norm, and it wasn't changed, and it was a commonly held uh, ideal. You know, put your pencils down. Well, what, that's not what's happened. As we know, we're living in a very different time where so many of these gains and so many of these values are under siege. Um, really about 15 years ago, uh, this really started in earnest in the aftermath of the Florida recount. I, I think it probably happened at around four in the morning that first night. Uh, the uh, electorate was so closely divided uh, that it suddenly became clear to partisans that it wasn't this swing vote that you would try to woo, but that you could win or lose based on turnout, and that you could win by boosting your turnout or by suppressing the other side's turnout. And in fact, a series of measures to restrict that right to vote or to, or to make it less meaningful became a core operating political tenet of the modern conservative movement. This had gone back actually quite a long way. I mean, the, the, there was, the, the, in 1980, when Ronald Reagan accepted the Republican presidential nomination and really began the political era that then lasted for several decades, um, he, he kind of consecrated this moment at a, a very widely covered event in Houston, Texas, where he spoke before 15,000 conservative evangelical ministers. Uh, and, and it was the beginning of the modern conservative coalition. But what people didn't catch quite as significantly was the, one of the warm-up speakers was a guy named Paul Weirich. He said, you know, so many of my Christian brethren uh, want everybody to be able to vote. Let's be honest, I don't want everybody to be able to vote. In fact, our, our share of the vote goes down the more people vote. He was very frank. Paul Weirich was not just a, a guy on a bar stool mouthing off. He founded uh, many of the key institutions that then pushed for restricting those voting rights. He founded a group called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, which is a nationwide business lobbying group that lobbies state legislatures and wrote the voter ID laws that were passed in so many states. 
he founded a group called the Heritage Foundation, the think tank that has done more than just about anybody to popularize this notion that there must be somewhere great amounts of voter fraud which justify these new laws. And uh, the clamor over voter fraud built throughout the last 15 years. It's important to understand uh, that while there has been, over the course of American history, a great deal of election misconduct by party leaders and insiders, voter fraud of the kind that is touched by these current laws is virtually non-existent. You are more likely to be hit by lightning, statistically, than to commit in-person voter impersonation in the United States right now. And in 2011, uh, Dozens of states, when the political terrain shifted, dozens of states passed new laws to make it harder for people to vote for the first time since the Jim Crow era. And uh, as was described in the introduction, uh, the, those laws were actually blocked by the courts, by federal and state judges, by Democratic and Republican judges who believed that these laws impinged on a very fundamental basic American right. Uh, and it really seemed as if this issue, in some respects, had been put to bed. But then the most partisan court in the country, the US Supreme Court, entered the fray. Now, they had already ruled in, the, in, a, very, in, a, in a decision that was, in so many ways, the, the high mark of the activist, uh, interventionist Supreme Court of this time. In 2010, the, uh, had already issued the Citizens United ruling, which knocked down a century of campaign finance laws. And that, that, that built on other rulings that did something similar. In 2013, the Supreme Court, by the same five to four margin, gutted the Voting Rights Act, the most successful civil rights law in American history, in a case called Shelby County versus Holder. John Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, wrote the opinion, and he basically said, that was then, this is now. He pointed out that black turnout was now as high as white turnout in the South. And he said it wasn't needed anymore. Um, the, the, I would argue that the true spirit of the ruling came from Justice Scalia, who didn't write it, but in the courtroom said that the Voting Rights Act was little more than, quote, a racial entitlement. And people gasped in the courtroom. You can hear it on the tape. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote a very passionate dissent. And she said, uh, you know, saying that it doesn't, that, that it no, it's no longer is needed because it's worked so well is like standing in a rainstorm holding an umbrella and not getting wet and deciding, therefore, you no longer need the umbrella. Um, and that was her prediction. That was her argument. Well, what happened? Uh, two hours after the Supreme Court issued its ruling, uh, states began moving to make it harder once again to vote. Two hours after that ruling, the state of Texas implemented its voter ID law. It's important to say, I'm, not against, I'm actually for voter ID. I think it's sensible that people should have to be who they say they are and, and have to prove it. Um, I'm against ID laws that require IDs that lots of people don't have. That was what Texas's law did. It, it, it was utterly mischievous in its intent and its application. This is the law that you might have heard about that um, says you cannot use your University of Texas student ID as a government ID, but you can use your concealed carry gun permit. It's not a coincidence. Um, and instantly, as soon as that law was passed, 608,000 registered voters in Texas were disenfranchised. People who were not theoretical voters, actual registered voters just didn't have that paperwork. One of them was a woman named Sammy Louise Bates uh, that my organization found. Um, she grew up in Mississippi. She remembered counting out the poll tax for her grandmother at the time. She moved to Detroit and then Chicago. It's kind of a classic American internal migration story. She worked, she actually went to college, um, worked her whole life, and then retired and moved to Texas and lived and lives on social security and nothing else. And she's voted, she did everything right. She's voted since she was 21, but she didn't have a birth certificate with her. And so she lost the right to vote. And she was asked by lawyers in testimony, um, well, why didn't you get the birth certificate? 
And she said, well, it costs $42. And I had to put those $42 where they would do the most good. You can't eat a birth certificate. And she was the lead witness in a federal trial uh, that went on for weeks, and a federal judge ruled that the Texas voter ID law was in fact discriminatory and unconstitutional and illegal. And that ruling was upheld by the most conservative court, the Fifth Circuit, in the land, the most conservative federal appeals court, but it's still on the books because litigation turns out to be a rather inefficient way of, uh, of validating our democratic rights. It's grinding on and on, and meanwhile, uh, meanwhile, it's still happening. We all saw in Arizona last week the consequences of not having uh, the Voting Rights Act in, in meaningful place. In the past, uh, in Maricopa County, something like 70% of the polling places were closed in that heavily Latino jurisdiction. Um, and you had long, long, long lines in the primary. And uh, in the past, that would have been blocked by the Justice Department, which had to pre-approve any changes like that, or a federal court. We can expect to see hand-to-hand -hand combat on issues like this uh, all over the country between now and the election. So it's a challenging time. It's a challenging time, and we don't know what the full outcome is going to be. But there's also a possibility of a different story. There's also, believe it or not, reason for optimism. Why am I optimistic? Not just you know, temperament. Um, one, is one reason is because people are talking about this. This is an election where people are talking about how government works or doesn't work, not just what it's supposed to do for the first time in a long, long time. But whether it's Bernie Sanders talking about campaign finance reform and uh, receiving so much money from small donors, or Donald Trump bragging that he is the only self-financed candidate in the race who, and thus can't be bought, to Hillary Clinton, who has, in a more muted way, put out the most ambitious policy proposals on voting and campaign finance of any of the candidates, this is something the candidates are reacting to the voters to. There's deep public concern about this. Nobody can, can argue anymore that the public doesn't care about the state of democracy. Part of what's happening because of that is there's a a uh, tremendous ferment all over the country of new reforms, new changes, uh, and new energy on all these issues, on voting. Uh, the biggest change, the most important change that could happen would be if we change the way we register voters in the United States. We have a ramshackle voter registration system that leaves so many people out, yet is so filled with error. And if we move to automatic, permanent, universal voter registration conducted by the government, as all the other democracies have, you would add tens of millions of people to the rolls. It would cost less, and it would curb the potential for fraud for people who really care about that. And it's starting to happen. In Oregon, in California, just pa last year passed automatic registration at the DMVs, and this is a model that can be expanded to other agencies. West Virginia, the Republicans and Democrats together passed this, and the governor's gonna sign it this week. It passed the legislature in New Jersey, um, although Governor Chris Christie vetoed it, but they'll override that, I think. It's moving in Illinois. President Obama talked about it um, at, uh, at the uh, Illinois legislature. Uh, this is the wave of the future, and it's very exciting. Um, you're seeing other kinds of positive changes as well. In the area of campaign finance, even in the face of super PACs, even in the face of Citizens United, Meaningful public financing is still the best answer to give ordinary people a voice. And the model that you all voted into, into being here in Seattle is a great breakthrough uh, for the country that everybody's watching very closely. We have had a public financing system in New York City for uh, two decades. It's a little different. It's a, it's a contributions from small donors are matched through a mul multiple taxpayer match. And it works incredibly well. Obviously, the model that's here where people get a voucher and it empowers them it could be, a, uh, could be a, a, a real breakthrough. And has an interesting appeal to conservatives, too, because they can envision that as in the form of a tax credit. Um, and uh, does the same thing in many ways. Uh, even on the very difficult challenge, I, I should say also that there's reason for optimism on the constitutional questions. 
we're engaged in a decade-long drive to overturn Citizens United, and not only Citizens United, but Buckley versus Vallejo and the other Supreme Court cases that have gotten us into this mess. And we can see a path to do that, just as uh, the gun rights advocates persuaded the Supreme Court to change its view of the Second Amendment. And I would have said this even before the vacancy created by the death of Justice Scalia. This is now at the center of that debate, these laws of democracy. And even on the toughest issue to crack in a way, which is gerrymandering, because both parties do it and it's been with us since the beginning, there's actually progress. You're starting to see states, uh, last year the Supreme Court blessed uh, the idea of nonpartisan citizen redistricting commissions uh, enacted by the public. And in California they have one, in Arizona they have one. You're starting to see them put into effect elsewhere. Arizona, uh, Ohio, rather, just a couple of months ago, backed by Governor Kasich, moved toward that. So there is a tremendous ferment. In a way, we saw, we, we're at a tipping point. We can be like in the late 1800s, when democracy restrict, constricted and moved backwards, or we can be like the progressive era that followed, a time of reform and revitalization. So that's up to all of us. Um, John Adams was right. There will be no end of it. It's not something that's gonna be finished in any generation. It's not gonna be a permanent solution to the question of how we build a democracy. All of us are writing the next chapter. Um, and uh, I hope we keep at it uh, and there will be no end of it. So thank you for your patience and I would love to hear your questions or, uh, or comments or conversation. You, you, you may consider this too dystopian or conspiratorial. I once posed this question to our, my congressman, Jim McDermott, and he, um, he avoided it. But um, I, I, the, starting with, uh, beginning about two to three years, let's, let's say four years ago when the Republicans decided to evaluate the results of the 2000, 2012 election, and their basic response was that they needed to improve their optics. I finally gave up in the Republican Party. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm an independent. I, I have no... I have no use for um, any sort of um, um, party, and I've, I've always tried to vote for the, for the person, but it's, it's become too difficult now. And I, I think that if, I, mean, I have a scenario that if a Republican wins the presidency, I think voting rights will be, um, well, that, that tipping point will tip back. And I think the, the restrictive voting rights laws that have been passed in so many states will, 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 will increase. And I think that we will have um, basic um, distortion of our, of our voting from then on, and it will never change again. And I think Mitch McConnell, he could end the, um, the filibuster rule in a heartbeat. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting point, because it is, as I said, uh, and, and I was cautious and, and, and quite deliberate in how I wrote about this, because this book is not a partisan screed in one way or another. And the, and one political party or another has been fighting, generally speaking, to expand democracy and another to restrict it. And it's often been uh, the party that, re re that re represents kind of the incumbent group that is afraid of uh, demographic change or change, that is looking for ways to change the rules. Going back to the 1800 election, when the Federalists, being worried that the new states entering the Union were gonna be full of small farmers and vote for Thomas Jefferson. They actually took away the right to vote for president in a bunch of states. That was just the first time, but that's happened a lot. It is undeniable that there was a coherent political strategy to take on voting and to take on these campaign finance rules. Whenever conservatives got so much as a pinky on a lever of power, this was the first thing they turned to. Um, what's interesting is not, that's not so unusual. What's unusual is that until recently at least, the Democrats didn't have a similar strategy to expand democracy. Um, after the 2008 election, the Democrats had a filibuster-proof majority in the US Senate and the House, a strong majority in the House and the presidency. And I know there was a lot of other stuff going on, but uh, they never proposed a bill to strengthen voting rights. They never proposed uh, or moved a bill for universal and automatic voter registration. Um, President Obama was the first major party candidate in decades to not take public financing for his campaign. Um, 
but said, don't worry, it's okay. And, and the system was really broken, so I didn't blame him for that. But he said, I'm going to fix it. We're going to propose campaign finance reform. He never proposed anything. And uh, it's been this, this, the silence of the Democrats that has been more unusual and more problematic. Even now, President Obama could do something significant about this and is not doing it. Um, you, you may be familiar with the phenomenon of what's called dark money, which is uh, secret campaign spending. Uh, it's not quite from Citizens United, it's from other decisions, but basically hundreds of millions of dollars in campaign spending that is uh, donated in secret. And we don't know who, who's giving the money. And there was a, a proposed law to bring the dark money into daylight uh, that was filibustered. Um, and, but President Obama could sign an executive order right now to require all government contractors, federal government contractors, to disclose all their political spending. And uh, it would be gr a powerful anti-corruption measure. And he hasn't done it. They're utterly aware of it. They, he just, for whatever reason, has not done it. So the only hope to avoid that is not going to really be in the courts, although the courts have really changed pretty considerably in how they see these laws, but in the public putting pressure on the politicians to fight it. Um, and I do, I, you know, there's a worry that you could have a ratcheting effect and it's hard to undo, but I think that you'll also, you would also see a very big battle on these things if that were to happen. In uh, 1993, the motor voter law was passed. Uh, could you tell us what the effect of that has been? Yes, uh, in 1993, that was the last major law that was passed. Uh, well, th th in 1993, the National Voter Registration Act, known colloquially as motor voter, was enacted. And what it did was it required government agencies uh, especially the DMV, that's why it's called Motor Voter, but other agencies too, to try to help people register to vote. And it was a success for a while in a limited way. What happened was a lot of the states didn't want to implement it. And while the DMVs often do register voters, the other agencies that were supposed to register them too, the, the welfare agencies, just didn't do it. And even now, the DMVs don't do it so much. So it's been good, but not the next big step is actually to make it automatic, um, which is how other countries do it. So it's been positive. It hasn't had a negative impact, but it hasn't, it hasn't lived up to uh, a lot of the hopes people had for it. And even there, too, the Obama administration, for reasons none of us can fathom, has turned down the requests by state governments to uh, expand motor voter to other agencies. So uh, although the, the people don't realize this, the healthcare exchanges count as a government agency and they, uh, you actually can register to vote through that. So it's been pretty successful, though not uh, sort of a mixed record. From what you were saying earlier, most of the prior movements uh, to expand the franchise were about expanding its scope going from you know, landed men, property, to unproperty, to women, uh, people who weren't white, to twice. It seems now we're dealing with a different phenomenon. It's not trying to build a movement to expand the franchise. It's trying to keep it from being whittled away. It's trying to keep people from being knocked off the rolls, trying to prevent um, or, or roll back onerous restrictions on who can actually vote at the polls on a given day. How? Do you build a movement around saying, no, don't shave it off around the edges? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because I think sometimes it, uh, you can actually mobilize political activity around not losing what you have more easily than trying to motivate people to seek something they don't have. Um, and uh, so uh, you see in places like North Carolina, for example, um, after the Voting Rights Act case, North Carolina passed the most ambitious law to restrict the right to vote that there was. It not only, it had a voter ID provision, but, but that actually wasn't the worst part of it. It cut back on early voting, especially on the days that African Americans voted, the Sunday before the election called Soul, the program known as Souls to the Polls. Um, 
it, uh, it did have a voter ID provision. It made it harder to register voters, and for good measure, it ended public financing for judicial elections and a few other things. And there was a popular movement there, uh, tens of thousands of people demonstrating every week uh, and really convulsed the state's politics and pushed back. So people actually started, when we worked on this, we were worried, not in North Carolina, but more broadly, that talking about these obstacles to voting would make it so people wouldn't want to vote. Because people would think, why bother? It's going to be difficult and pain in the neck. And uh, there was social science and psychological analysis that said it, that talking about disenfranchisement caused disenfranchisement. That's not what happened at all. People got really mad and voted to validate their right to vote. But there's a more interesting point, too, which is that, um, and the book talks this, about this a lot, from the beginning, people understood that the ways of, of even if there's a formal right to vote, the, the ways of manipulating the system to make that vote not count or to, or to diminish its import was something that had to be worried about and blocked and fought against. James Madison, uh, he kind of thought there should be a property requirement. He, he was not, he didn't care that much. And, and they didn't really debate that much at the Constitutional Convention about this question of who should vote. But Madison cared passionately about the manipulation that could take place to effectively disenfranchise people who did have the right to vote in formal terms. Uh, he actually insisted on a provision in the Constitution that uh, is called the Elections Clause, which says that states set the voting rules, but the federal government has the power to supersede those rules. And that's the, one of the only places in the whole Constitution where the federal government is given that power to actually meddle in state governance. And it's because very explicitly Madison believed state legislatures were going to pass disenfranchising laws to make to make it harder for their opponents' supporters to vote, and that they would gerrymander, as we now call it, that they would draw the electoral lines to favor themselves. And, uh, and there's a long tradition of that kind of stuff that people have managed to fight about, too. The whole movement for one person, one vote, which meant that you had to have equal-sized legislative districts was an example of that. And, and again, throughout history, campaign finance over here and voting rights over here were not seen as separate and siloed issues, but actually as part of the same fight. So I think that there can be a fight waged on these almost um, next generation issues that are not quite as direct as women or African Americans having the right to vote. Thanks. I'm curious about our registration in Washington, that we don't register for a party, we don't register Democratic or Republican, and I'm wondering if that, if you think that makes any difference um, in redistricting or gerrymandering, if there's any advantage to that, um, or what the effect of that is? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, so gerrymandering is something that has been um, around from the beginning. Um, James Madison, in the very first congressional election, uh, James Madison was gerrymandered. Uh, Patrick Henry drew his district to try to keep Madison from getting elected because Patrick Henry was against the Constitution. Um, and interestingly, Madison, because he had a much tougher race than he expected, um, the swing vote in the district that Madison ran in, the fifth district of Virginia, was uh, the Baptists. And they were the free-thinking religious minority there. And they said, Mad and Madison also had a, a tough opponent that they ran against him who was kind of a charismatic, not too bright war hero, James Monroe. And the Baptist said to Madison, we will support you if you flip flop on your major position, which was Madison opposed there being a Bill of Rights. He opposed having amendments to the Constitution. He'd written the Constitution, he wrote the Federalist Papers to explain why it was fine as it was. But they said, we'll support you if you come out for a religious freedom amendment. So Madison was the first politician to have the first great American flip-flop, and he had this whole explanation of how it's true that I always opposed it, but that was then, and in fact, I haven't changed my position, but now I'm for the Bill of Rights. And of course, he, he passed it through Congress. So we've had gerrymandering you know, from that first Garden of Eden moment in American democracy, and both parties do it uh, with gusto whenever they can. In the most recent round, the Republicans were the ones who were able to do it, but Democrats have done it just as much. There was a time when not being able to know who 
people were in terms of their partisan affiliation really would have been a hindrance because it was somewhat crude, the tools people used to draw these lines and to guess where the voters were. And it was even things like what kind of car did people drive and that sort of thing. But now the uh, big data has made it possible. And it's all computerized. And so it doesn't matter whether people declare themselves to be Democrats or Republicans. The party insiders know fully well how people are going to vote based on a whole host of data points. And so I actually think it doesn't affect in all likelihood, the, the way lines are drawn here. Um, though there are arguments for and against a nonpartisan registration like there is in Washington State. In 2012, um, I remember Rachel Maddow um, spending show after show on this, but there were lines waiting for pe with people waiting to vote for seven or eight hours in Florida yep. and I think Wisconsin. And I really thought that was going to be re repeated in 2014. That was part of my dystopian tale. Um, and it didn't wasn't repeated, and it was, I was sorely disappointed in that, because uh, to me, there just not enough people wanted to vote to create right. those lines. Don't you think that that's going to happen uh, in state after state after state in 2016, and there's really nothing that's going to change that? Well, um, you're right that the difference between 2012 and 2014 was the size of the electorate. And a lot of these issues just don't happen when the voter turnout is low, and in midterm elections, they're really low. Um, it's almost two different electorates. Um, and so there's reason to think that they might come back. The, 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 uh, the reason to think perhaps that they might not, and, and what happened in Arizona last week is a bad omen. Um, the reason to think perhaps that, that it won't be as bad uh, is that, in fact, in 2012, most places were not so bad because there'd been the, the, this effective intervention by the courts not just because of the Voting Rights Act, but other ways as well. And some of this stuff, even as caught up as it is in the partisan crossfire, has been embraced by Democrats and Republicans. There was a presidential commission uh, appointed by President Obama that was chaired by Mitt Romney's lawyer, Ben Ginsburg, and Barack Obama's lawyer, Bob Bauer. They put out a bunch of recommendations on things like standardizing early voting to make sure that there were enough polling, voting machines for everybody and stuff like that. And um, the, uh, as well as modernizing voter registration. And states have begun to move all over the country quietly and without partisan rancor, almost in a technocratic way to do some of these things. So a lot of the problems with long lines have been diminished. But there's no question that the lines are longer in poor and, and more minority uh, heavy neighborhoods. And uh, just like we saw in Arizona. And uh, it's something we're monitoring very closely. And you know, you could certainly see it uh, happen again this time. How do you feel about voting by mail exclusively, which we have in Washington State? Um, you know, I haven't studied it that much. A, a number of my friends uh, urge us to take a close look at it. Um, I, uh, it's had some positive impact on turnout. Um, I have always been worried about the one place where there is a potential for misconduct in elections, which is absentee ballots, uh, where you see political figures manipulating things is by going into a nursing home or something like that and filling out all the ballots for people. I don't think there's evidence of that here. Um, and uh, I've, always, I've always been more partial to kind of ample early voting in-person opportunities, but I know folks who are very um, very enthusiastic about the experience here. I'd be interested in, in what you thought. But, uh, you know, right now about a third of people vote before Election Day all over the country. It's not only vote. There ought to be ample opportunity for vote by mail, but there's some people who want to do it on Election Day. And that's something where there's kind of consumer demand for a change in the way we vote and moving in that direction. What effects do you think the world wars had on voting rights and opinions towards voting? It's a great question. It's always been the case that military conflict has been a key driver of the expansion of voting rights. The War of 1812, I mean, the War of 1812, for example, in the, in the revolution, it was the militias, people I talked about in the last talk I gave here on the Second Amendment, the well-regulated militias that the Second Amendment was designed to protect uh, were not all property owners, and they were demanding the right to vote. 
And the War of 1812 helped drive uh, the movement for uh, expanded voting rights for people without property. I mentioned how the Civil War, did, excuse me, did the same thing uh, for African American men. Um, World War I helped women win the right to vote because although it wasn't nearly as prominent as later in World War II, women actually flooded the workforce during World War I and took a lot of the jobs men had and it was kind of a moment when people understood women in a different way. And then in World War II, uh, the, the desegregation of the armed forces create, played a big role over time in building the civil rights movement uh, because a lot of the black soldiers who came back and had been overseas and then came back and were mistreated, uh, didn't take it, and helped form a big part of the nucleus of the civil rights movement. So I think that wars give a sense of who has a stake, and it also kind of mixes things up and jumbles, jumbles existing structures and orders, and uh, um, makes people think about the kind of the national good for a moment in a way that is more often, you know, our private pursuits. Interestingly, the Vietnam War uh, was during the time when the vote was given to 18-year-olds. But what turned out to be the case was, unlike these other wars, it wasn't given to 18-year-olds as a reward for their service. Um, nobody was being very nice to the Vietnam veterans at that moment. It was uh, given because they were afraid of all the student protesters and they thought if they gave them the right to vote, they would calm down. It didn't work. It didn't work. <laughs> well, it did work, actually, kind of. Everybody did calm down, but not quite. They all thought they would vote for McGovern. They thought they would vote for the Democrats, and they actually voted for Nixon, the, the new young voters. Uh, you spoke about a new age or a new era of democracy because of uh, the efforts being made by the three leading candidates. Uh, do you think that's only a result of this being a presidential national election, and do you think those efforts will be continued in 17 or 18, or do you think that people will feel more just uh, apathetic and unrepresented by, unrepresented by any politician, uh, and that's a, uh, at the heart of why there's such a few uh, portion of the population that actually participates in democracy? I think that is a great question, and it's the core of, of the dilemma we face as a country. Uh, you know, I think putting pressure on the political figures and them taking this up as an issue is a critical part of this. But the, what often happens is then they forget about it right after. Um, in 1992, I worked on this issue for President Clinton, and Ross Perot was a third party candidate that year. and. He was a, a, an interesting character. Um, he, he won 19% of the vote, even after it was clear that he was out of his mind. And one of his big issues was actually political reform. And Clinton vowed to do it, push it. And we actually, as was described in the introduction when I came up here, we passed a public financing bill before the House, through the House and the Senate in 1993. It never was finalized. They never conferenced it, as it's known. They never wrote a final bill, because it was the liberal Democrats who secretly killed it, um, because they wanted to be able to raise the money. So the pressure has to continue. And it's often been a challenge. We have the ability to build good political campaigns in America. We have a much harder time translating that into ongoing um, movements for pressure on, on the political system. Um, uh, you know, if you remember, President Obama turned his campaign into OFA, Organizing for America, which barely did much of anything, uh, at least not, not what people had hoped. Um, and uh, it's a challenge for, for uh, folks going forward on that. Um, but I agree that the, it, just as it was described that you could have a ratcheting downward of diminished participation, people could turn off from the system at the same time. You know, I think that the, one of the reasons voter turnout has been as low as it is is because people think their votes don't matter very much. But for all different kinds of reasons, but they're not entirely irrational in thinking that. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I was wondering if you might speak on the disenfranchisement of uh, 
convicts and the effects that that has. Yeah, it's, that's actually a really interesting topic. So the, in the United States, um, we uh, disenfranchise in various ways people who've had felony convictions. And um, again, most of the world doesn't do it that way. It is a remnant of the Jim Crow era. A lot of these laws were put into place, um, written in such a way to make sure that they could be used against African Americans. Although it's important to note, it's actually in the Constitution. The 14th Amendment says you can have felony disenfranchisement. Um, there is actually reason for hope on this. This is something where there is a genuine bipartisan left-right movement to change the felony disenfranchisement laws uh, of a kind that you don't see on, on too many issues in this, in this realm. Um, we work very close, we work a lot on these laws. Uh, we work very closely with the conservative evangelicals. Um, one of our great allies, one of the champions on this in the Congress is Rand Paul. Um, uh, we work closely with a guy named Charles Coulson, who was a Watergate felon, um, and then uh, became a minister and, uh, and the head of prison ministries, and uh, was a great advocate on this issue. It's, what's happened, interestingly, in part, is that, you know, as you know, there is a nationwide uh, awakening about the reality and the costs of mass incarceration in the United States. There's a, uh, a broad understanding now that we have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prison population and that we don't need to do that to be safe and that this has huge and negative uh, social consequences. Well, people, there's a really exciting left-right movement that we're part of in our work on mass incarceration at the Brennan Center uh, to change these laws, but there's a recognition, too, that this felony disenfranchisement is kind of a side effect of those laws. There are millions of people in the United States who can't vote because they had a criminal conviction at age 18 for some drug offense or something like that. Three states still disenfranchise everybody who had any felony conviction at any point in their life. Iowa sort of a surprise, Florida and Virginia. Um, and uh, there's a real effort to try to change those laws there. But there's reason for hope. Just uh, two weeks ago, um, this was not a bipartisan example, the legislature in Maryland uh, restored the right to vote for 40,000 people and it was vetoed by the governor and it was overridden. So those people got the right to vote. They're actually uh, eligible to vote in the primary in a few weeks. So that's something where there's actually room for hope. I was a precinct rep for about 15 years. And uh, so I went to my district convention one time and I it was in some school and I came in the front door and there was a uh, booth right there of some outfit that uh, provided the service where they would do, you, do the math for you to redraw your district lines in your favor. <laughs> And you could actually hire them. And this was right in the, out in the open, which like I kind of, kind of caught me off guard. So have, this is pretty well organized. Have you ever heard of this before? No, <laughs> it sounds, I'm not surprised, but I've never heard of it. As I said, this used to be considered, uh, you know, the dark arts of, of a few political savants. Um, there was a guy, uh, and, and again, it was always both Democrats and Republicans who did this. Um, there was a guy named um, Phil Burton, who was one of the great, uh, progressive members of Congress from San Francisco. He, uh, he used to draw the legislative maps for the state of California. He would sit in a restaurant in Sacramento and, and draw them. Uh, and he said one district was his contribution to modern art, basically. He said, it's beautiful. It curls in and out like a snake. Um, and, but it, the tools were crude. They would say if, if, if a uh, district had Volvos, of course, they were progressive Democrats. And if they had Cadillacs, they were conservative Republicans. And if they had Buicks, they were middle-class Republicans. And uh, Pontiacs were middle-class Democrats. I mean, it was this whole convoluted thing. This is actually true. Chinese restaurants meant it was a heavily Jewish district. And that was how they knew. And now there's data files and big data and, and, and the ability to do this stuff with much more um, precise computer etching. Um, uh, which only makes it more dangerous and makes it, you know, you have, di you have states, New York State where I am, the state has changed enormously, 
the state Senate has stayed Republican, the state assembly has stayed Democrat for 50 years, regardless of the, the actual votes of the people. So this is a hard one, but again, these nonpartisan citizen commissions are the best bet that there is. There is also, this is interesting, even this Supreme Court, even, even in the last few years, they don't like gerrymandering. They just can't figure out what to do about it. They've said that. They look for, as they say, judicially manageable standard, and they can't find one, uh, since you're always gonna have some manipulation for partisan gain. There's actually reason to believe that they're willing to entertain uh, <coughs> lawsuits to try to draw a line. Um, and there's a lawsuit in Wisconsin brought by a professor from the University of Chicago. There's another one in Rhode Island. Um, and we're actually organizing a clearinghouse for all these lawsuits all over the country because I think the Supreme Court, even, even with Scalia on it, but certainly his successor, they were, they're ready to do something. They're, they, they're as appalled as everybody else. You all have been wonderful. I really appreciate the questions and your interest. Um, I'm happy to talk afterwards. I'm happy to sign books. Um, and I do ask you, if you're interested, uh, we have uh, red cards where you can sign up for the Brennan Center's newsletters, electronic newsletters. We guarantee they're nutrition-filled and no spam. Um, and uh, you can learn a lot about our work and, and all the other folks who are out there fighting for democracy. So thank you again for being here tonight.